they can watch the movie. No, we can go ahead and get started. Okay, um... Jeez, uh, I gotta get rid of that thing. That will go away. Uh, often people suffering from paraphilias do not seek treatment unless mandated by legal authorities. This is a problem. Um, uh, they don't think they have a problem. Um, imagine if you could... I was thinking about this earlier, and I was thinking, well, how in the world can I explain this to you guys? How, how, how can I make you understand what's going on? Well, think of it this way. Think of it this way. What if somebody told you, whatever your sexual orientation is, you have to reverse it? In other words, if, if, you're, if, if you're attracted to males, then now you have to be attracted to females. If you're attracted to females, then you have to be attracted to males. What if they told you you had to do that? Just think how difficult, almost impossible that would be for you to change your sexual orientation. Well, the reality is it's, that's how hard it is for these people, these individuals with a paraphilia, these individuals that are attracted to leather. You can't tell me I can't be a you know, What am I going to do? How am I, going to, how am I not going to be attracted to leather anymore? That's the problem. And for that reason, these guys don't go in to talk to anybody about what they're attracted to. Uh, you know, I like to wear women's underwear, and I'm a guy. You know, why? That, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Nobody says there's any... Oh, God, there's nothing wrong with that. Ah, I'll be back in a second. Let me get rid of this thing. Good trust me. Go away. Ah. I'm going to get rid of this thing. Make it go away. Can't throw it away. Make it go away. That's a fun. What? Oh! Ah. Wait a minute. Oh. It's, to finish and it's a virus? Yeah. No, it's trying to update something. No. It wouldn't go. It wouldn't leave. Are you sure you want to install the extension work hike? I do no. not want to do that. But I can't tell it. No. Press Cancel. Easy. There it goes. Cancel. See, it's configuring. Ah! No way. There we go. Oh. Mm. <laughs> now it's going to shut my computer down. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay. Anyway, sorry about that. Sorry about that out of the television room. Okay, here we go. Um, so this, this is a problem. This is a really serious problem. Uh, they don't. They don't realize they've got that. That, that this is. A, they don't see this as a problem. That they are. They have to lick somebody's eyeball in order to get sexually excited. That doesn't register with them. They think everybody does this. They, they, they think this is normal. Uh, and of course, they will claim that therapy is, is not needed. You know, this is just normal. Uh, once upon a time, um, uh, psychologists tried to cure homosexuality. It was Freud's big failure. It's one thing that he couldn't do. He could condition, he could, he could change just about any problem that you had. He could make you not worry about it anymore. But he couldn't do anything with homosexuality. It was his one big failure. So if you read, if you read Freud, Freud talks about it all the time. The fact that there's nothing you can do about this. And he claimed that homosexuality was normal. And of course, this was in the 19th, the, uh, the end of the 18th, uh, the 19th century. 
Uh, the church was going ballistic because of it. Uh, there were other individuals, other groups that were saying, my goodness gracious, there's some, obviously something wrong with you if you think this is normal behavior. But he said, I can't change it. There's nothing I can do to change it. And of course, this is the same, this is the same situation. Lack of motivation for change represents a serious impediment to therapy. If you want to make this guy, what's upon it? Let me tell you, one guy with a pedophilia. He would, he, his pedo, not pedophilia. One, he had a paraphilia. Uh, he liked women's shoes. He found women's shoes sexually exciting. Uh, he was in, lived in New York City, and uh, this was in the 1950s. Uh, so women would go to the uh, the park, and he would uh, crawl underneath the benches. And when they crossed their legs and had one foot that wasn't on the ground, he would steal their shoes. He'd reach out underneath and steal their shoes. And they were trying to find this guy. <laughs> they couldn't catch him. <laughs> and finally, finally they did. Finally they found him. They had a they hired a well, they hired a police woman. They had a police woman that was sitting there, and as soon as he grabbed her foot, he put, she grabbed his arm because she was looking for him him to grab a shoe, uh, and eventually, of course, they caught him, and went back to his apartment, opened up his closet, and lo and behold, he had uh, like 120 women's shoes in there. And what he had done, they were all, almost all right shoes. Uh, he didn't have any left shoes. And uh, they asked him, well, you know, 10% of the population is left, left handed, and if you're left-handed, you cross your left leg, not your right leg. And he said, I, I don't find those exciting at all. Mm -hmm. There's only right shoes. Sniffing right shoes. So if you've ever seen, there's something about Mary, if you, the, the guy in there has a foot <laughs> fetish, has shoe fetish, uh, and it, actually that's what this guy had. And, and what he did, he masturbated in his shoes. And then he, they're all, he's done, so he threw it in the closet. <laughs> but he thought it was normal. So what do we do with this guy? Well, they arrested him for, state, for, for thievery, for stealing, uh, for stealing shoes. Uh, they put him in a middle hospital, and they said there was nothing wrong. They, there was nothing wrong. He just loves the smell of sweaty old shoes. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so this, this is a problem. He didn't think that he had a problem. Um, as long as, I don't know, I guess if he married some woman with really stinky feet, he would have been the happiest guy in the whole county. <laughs> King County, I guess, is the county that we're talking about. Uh, so there's lack of motivation. It may make uh, deliberate attempts to fool the therapist. They, these individuals may make uh, deliberate attempts to fool the therapist into believing that the problem has improved when it has not. This is what we ran into all the time uh, when we were dealing with pedophiles and rapists. Uh, they tried to fool us all the time, and uh, sometimes they were successful. Uh, it's really hard to tell how serious these people are. Recidivism continues to be a serious problem, of course, and that means that uh, they, they commit the crime again. Pharmacological approaches attempt to reduce sexual arousal by giving estrogen-like or progestin-like hormones to the males, and this is known as chemical castration. So if we have a male that uh, is a rapist, uh, one of the ways that we can control them is to lower their testosterone level. And we do that by giving them female hormones, and it's known as chemical castration. Now the other problem with this is, and this is the reason that they don't like it, uh, the other problem is they have no normal sexual uh, response uh, if, they, if they're taking too much estrogen. The other problem is that they, uh, they lose their body hair and they start growing fat. They, they start accumulating fat in select areas of their bodies. They don't like that either. And for that reason, chemical castration, of course, uh, is illegal, actually, it's illegal in the United States. You can voluntarily uh, be uh, chemically castrated in the United States, but you can't. You can voluntarily do it, but they can't order you to do it. And if they ordered you to do it, I mean, it's a pill, okay? So you wouldn't have to take the pill. And this is a problem. There's a lot of individuals that, uh, that suggest that that's what we should do with rapists. We should castrate them physically, or we should chemically castrate them uh, but the reality is we can't, that's uh, cruel and unusual punishment thing. We can't do it in the United 
United States. It is done in other countries, however. They do use chemical castration and physical castration uh, in order to punish uh, these select individuals. Behavioral treatment uh, tends to include master masturbatory uh, retraining or aversion techniques. If you've ever seen the movie uh, uh, Clockwork Orange, uh, which, okay, it's, it's an old, old movie. <laughs> I know, it's an old movie. But in the end of the movie, they actually uh, use behavioral techniques. They uh, use aversion techniques to train this individual not to rape women. Uh, he's a, uh, he's kind of a, it's a really kind of a nasty movie. But in, in the end, of course, they bring a naked woman out. And uh, because he has gone through all this aversion uh, therapy, uh, he starts crying and he starts throwing up uh, when he sees the naked woman. It's really kind of a clockwork orange, yeah, by Anthony Burgess. I know it's it's really kind of a strange movie. <laughs> it's a really strange movie. Okay. Well. <clears throat> uh, there's a lot. There's nudity. In it, so. A diverse set of cognitive behavioral procedures involving cognitive restructuring, relapse prevention, and empathy training, mm -hmm. identification with the victim, uh, have also been employed in individual case studies with some positive results. Uh, the, the biggest problem is getting these individuals to identify with their victims. Uh, if we can do that, then of course they will develop empathy, and if they develop empathy, they are less likely to uh, want to uh, damage that select individual. Gender dysphoria is a strong and persistent cross-gender identification and persistent discomfort with one's assigned sex or the gender role associated with it. Uh, so this is gender dysphoria. Uh, transgenderism, of course, is something that we is acceptable in the United States now. Uh, for this reason, gender dysphoria may sound like I'm talking, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, preaching against uh, uh, transgenderism. But the reality is uh, these individuals that suffer from gender dysphoria hate themselves because of their body parts and they want to be the opposite sex. It's causing them discomfort and for this reason, of course, it's, it's a, a mental illness. Uh, an individual that's transgender has accepted who they are and what they're thinking and that individual wants to change. They want gender reassignment surgery, which is them becoming the opposite sex. This is an individual that is suffering from uh, they're suffering with, with this problem. Will they become transgender in the future? Potentially they will. But right now they have, it, it's, it's uh, disrupting them. It's causing them discomfort. Uh, somebody who's transgender or somebody that is gay uh, identifies with the opposite sex, or the, the, uh, with, with their own sex. Uh, these individuals don't have a problem. They don't have as much discomfort. It's not causing them psychological pain. So gender dysphoria is a, a situation where the individual would like to have the, uh, the uh, body parts of the opposite sex. Uh, and, and, it, and they say that gender dysphoria causes a significant distress. It has to cause a significant distress. <clears throat> if you look on Facebook, if you read Facebook, there are individuals that identify themselves as asexual, they identify themselves as transgender, they identify themselves as a lot of different things, but they have accepted who they are and they have accepted their bodies as it is. Maybe they will change, maybe they will, will uh, have the surgery sometime in the future, but they're not dysphoric. Dysphoria means they, they feel bad. And it's only for a while, usually? What, uh, gender dysphoria? Mm -hmm. No, this gender dysphoria lasts for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Them feeling bad about who they are. So this individual needs to become transgender. They need to change their gender in order to feel good about themselves. Because I meant it can be little for a while, having gender dysphoria for a while, and then when they change, that's when it's kind of gone? Well, yeah, they won't, won't have dysphoria anymore. But of course, we're, we're going to talk about that in just a second as, as, to, as to what needs to happen in order for this to stop being dysphoria. Uh, early onset gender dysphoria starts in childhood, of course. And uh, now they tell you uh, if you have a child that, that uh, doesn't identify with this, their, 
their assigned sex with the sex they were born with, uh, that you should uh, not try to force them into being that individual. If you do, now we've got now we got another problem. We've got a more serious problem, and that potentially is the real reason for gender dysphoria. Is because people aren't allowing their children to be who they want to be. They're they they're trying to make them who they want them to be. So, if they're if they're a male, and the dad wants them to be a football player, and he wants to be a ballerina, Ina, not a ballet dancer, a ballerina. And now we got a problem because dad's going to be harassing this child and, and potentially abusing the child. So I certainly psychologically abusing the child because they're not act, acting as masculine as, he, as they want them to be. Now we got a really serious problem. Uh, there is uh, early their childhood dysphoria. And there's also late onset dysphoria, which begins after puberty. I told you the story, I'm sure I've told you the story of my sister's husband. Uh, okay. <laughs> Bob? <laughs> yeah. Okay, he was Bob, and she married Bob, <clears throat> really happy with the guy, everything seemed to be perfect. He was the perfect man because he wasn't, you know, hyper-masculine like all the rest of us, you know, farting and making 13-year-old voice sounds and smelling bad and all that other stuff. <clears throat> so my sister really liked this guy, and then one day he came up to her and he said, uh, honey? <laughs> I'd like to be your sister. I've always felt like Vivian on the inside. And that was the question. How long, how long have you felt like Vivian on the inside there, Bob? Since Bob was your assigned name, and this is the name that you've always wanted, and how, where the hell did you ever come up with the name Vivian? Anyway. But he's always been Vivian on the inside. He's always felt like Vivian on the inside. Had a really heavy beard, bald-headed, really heavy black beard. He's the ugliest one you could possibly have. Not the ugly. Well, yeah, he was. <laughs> he had to wear a scarf because his hair was so short. Anyway, so he had, uh, he had gender dysphoria. He was suffering from gender dysphoria. And, and as soon as he uh, admitted that uh, he wanted to be a woman, uh, he started dressing like a woman, started calling himself Vivian. He had his uh, driver's license changed to Vivian instead of Bob. Robert. Of course, I still think of uh, think of him as Bob because it really upset my sister a lot, and th that's that's another story. And we won't go into that story. But he became well. He wants to become transgender. I don't know if he's ever had the, the reassignment surgery, but he considers himself uh, uh, transgender. Uh, before that, he was gender dysphoric. Does that make sense? Okay. So he was suffering from it. He had distress, and finally he had to confront his, his problem and deal with it. And he did that by, by admitting that he wanted to be a woman. Uh, the gender dysphoria in children, uh, the child expresses the wish to grow the genitals of the other sex. Uh, a lot of times this uh, can uh, lead to mutilation. Uh, if it's, a, little, if it's a, a boy, they may try to cut their penis off. Uh, they may uh, do damage to their testicles, uh, and, and of course that's a relatively sensitive area, so that can be extremely painful. Uh, so this is one of the things uh, that, that we see. Uh, some women uh, will grow up hating their breasts and uh, potentially do damage. They, they become cutters. Usually they cut their arms, but sometimes they will, they will cut their breasts. Uh, individuals suffering from gender dysphoria. Uh, they prefer the stereotypic play mannerisms and attire of the other gender. Uh, of course, if it's a little girl, she will become a, a tomboy. Potentially, she will adopt a male name. Uh, and that, uh, well, just like Bob uh, adopted Vivian as his name, uh, but a lot of times they will uh, adopt a, 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 name, of, a, a, a name of the other gender. Uh, over time, uh, cross-gender behaviors tend to decline for most children. Uh, this is relatively common. Uh, as soon as puberty hits, 
uh, and they get an influx of, if it's a male, if they get an influx of testosterone, or if it's a female, she, gets, uh, she has her first period, a lot of times the gender dysphoria will go away. They will start identifying with their own, with the, uh, with their own gender, <clears throat> with their assigned gender. So one of the things that you should do is allow your child to be whoever they want to be. I know that sounds kind of odd, you don't, uh, but you, you don't try to force them to, uh, uh, to fit the, the stereotype that, that you expect them to fit. You need to allow them to do what they want to do. Otherwise, we got a really screwed up kid, and that's not good. Uh, gender dysphoria t does tend to be more persistent in girls. Uh, we have a lot more tomboys out there than we have, gee, I don't know what to call them here, boy. Tomboy. <laughs> anyway, Tom girl. My name's not a Tom girl. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Nancy boy. Nancy boy. That's, that, that's it. Okay. Nancy girl. Well, he's a boy, so we call him Nancy. Nancy boy. Nancy boy. My sister's name is Nancy, so... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, she's my sister. I can, I can dislike her if I like. Uh, most boys, two-thirds two, uh, or more, who do not persist in gender dysphoria, identify as gay or homosexual. Uh, girls who do not persist in disorder identify as lesbian or at lower rates than the boys do, of course. Uh, so this, and this is a relatively common... Uh, uh, trajectory uh, for both males and females. Uh, homosexuality, uh, I, uh, well, I don't know. It, it's really difficult to say uh, what the percentage of, uh, of uh, homosexuals uh, in, the, in the United States or in the world is. Uh, but at one point we said it was between 1 and 4 percent, and, and the, the figures seem to be rising uh, as the acceptance for homosexuality is increasing. Right, then. exactly, so exactly. It and it was unacceptable. Not only that, it was against the law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so people were, were hiding it a lot more. So they had this, it was more common back then. It's more common now than it was back then. Mm -hmm. Which is logical, because people were hiding it more. And since they were hiding it, I mean... What is that called when they're just hiding it? Repression? Mm -hmm. Denial? Latency? Mm -hmm. We used to... We used to talk about latent homosexuals. We don't anymore. We don't talk about latent homosexuals. Uh, latent homosexuality was somebody that was actually gay. Uh, felt like they felt they they were in denial inside their own minds. So they were latent homosexuals. Uh, and of course, they'd have to get into, into, into a situation where they could express their homosexuality, where it was accept, an acceptable practice for them to actually become homosexual. So they were late in I know. This is weird, isn't it? So I, I first started in this field in the 1970s, and th that was a term that we used a lot, latent homosexual. Uh, Freud talked about latent homosexuality. Uh, people that were actually gay and didn't realize it uh, had, were in such denial that they, they, they didn't, wouldn't even admit it to themselves. <clears throat> Uh, so if you've ever seen a movie where everybody's saying, well, yeah, I know this guy's gay, and the guy's in de de denying it completely, that, that's what latent homosexuality looked like. Everybody knew this guy was gay because of some of the things that he did, some of the ways that he acted, but uh, he was in denial and wouldn't admit that he was. Does that lead to depression? Uh, it, it will, it, yeah, it will if, if he doesn't eventually figure out who he is. Okay. Yeah, it can lead to all kinds of interesting problems. And of course, it all stems from his sexual orientation. So we're dealing with depression, and of course, we're dealing, we're trying, trying to fix the depression and the anxiety, and he may become suicidal. And of course, we need to go back to the root cause. And in this case, the root cause is, is the fact that he's actually dead, and he needs to admit it to himself. Okay, I know that doesn't happen nearly as much today because a homosexuality is more accepted. It's still not completely acceptable. I mean, it's legal. And gay marriage is legal. 
is it like that? Like in all the other cultures? Like other religious like um and like Iraq? Like, um, You're thinking of Iran? Iraq? Like Iraq. You'd be surprised. Uh, in Muslim countries, uh, they they talk a good ball game, but actually they accept uh, homosexuality more, a lot more readily than, than we do uh, in the United States. But homosexual rape is very common uh, in those areas, and of course, <clears throat> in Muslim countries, um, you know, Turkey. Yeah. Okay. okay, I know. Children, actually, it's, I believe that is child. It's not child pornography, of course, but it's uh, uh, child prostitution. is relatively common over there. Yeah, mm -hmm. girl boys. Okay, so what are we dealing with? We're dealing with gender dysphoria. <clears throat> uh, in adolescents and adults, there is a frequent expression of the desire to live as or to become the other sex including interest in sex change surgery or, or, or hormonal treatments. Uh, as soon as they admit that this is, is what's going on, and a lot of times the gender dysphoria goes away. And what I, what I mean is they accept the fact that they're transgender. And now they don't have a problem because it, it's not causing them distress. Uh, they can be specified as post-transition, uh, 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 living as the other gender and preparing for the uh, for or having some medical procedures to alter gender in adolescence and adulthood. Uh, these individuals, a lot of times, uh, if they're a male, uh, they just wants to transition to a female, they'll take female hormones. Um, they will take, uh, what is that stuff? That blocks testosterone. Ah, I can't think of it. Ah, I can't think of it. Anyway. Uh, we used to give women shots of this stuff to, as a birth control. Mm -hmm. What am I thinking? What is that stuff? Uh, Norplant was, was this stuff. Oh, I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Oh, what is it? Is it the Depo-Prevera? No. Depo-Prevera. Depo -Prevera. Yeah, Depo-Prevera. Yeah. Anyway, it blocks testosterone. So we would give them Depo-Prevera, potentially. Uh, their hair would fall out uh, if, if they were male, of course. But uh, we'd give them estrogen, uh, they would start growing breast tissue, uh, for example. Um, we see a lot more males transitioning to female than we see females transitioning to males. A lot more difficult surgery, too. So. <clears throat> There's another one called anti-androgen. I'm sorry? Anti-androgens. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the hydrotestosterone groups. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's the Depo-Provera. Depo-Provera. Yeah, that's what, <laughs> that's what was in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, uh, so th these individuals are transitioning. Once they transition or, or accept the fact that they want to be the opposite sex, of course, now their gender dysphoria goes away. Uh, so now it's acceptable practice. He probably, in, in the DSM-6, this will not be in there. Gender dysphoria will be gone. Um, the, the, the biggest changes in all the DSMs have been in this area. I mean, you can imagine how, how uh, earth-shattering it was when they took homosexuality out as a uh, mental illness and then it, uh, after the DSM-5. That was in the 1970s. And the DSM-3 came out. I'm sorry, the DSM-3. Uh, gender dysphoria appears to be quite rare, although little data exists. In clinical settings, males outnumber females by at least two to three. Uh, in some countries like J Japan and Poland, females may outnumber males. It all depends on the culture. As interesting as that is, the more male dominated it is, the more likely you'll see females wanting to transition to males. As logical as that is. Okay. 
Accurate diagnosis of gender dysphoria is difficult. In the DSM-5, gender dysphoria must be distinguished from simple nonconformity to stereotypic sex roles and must not be based merely on the cultural advantages of being the other sex. And this is a tough one. This is a really, this is really, really tough. Uh, you want somebody to be comfortable with who they are. Normally it has to do with the family rejecting them. And because the family rejects them, that's what's causing the dysphoria. So a lot of times what you need to do is family therapy with the entire family. Uh, and, and of course that's almost, a, it's very difficult to get people to, uh, to accept that. To accept if they don't believe in homosexuality, for example, or they don't believe that uh, anybody can transition to the opposite sex. I was just reading a book where uh, <laughs> I was just reading a book where um, one of the individuals in the family was a very strong female, and the male was her baby brother, and he was he wanted to transition to be a female, and as it turned out, in the end, she transitioned to be a male, and he transitioned to be a female. It was really kind of an interesting book, but they were both robots, so I know. <laughs> What's, what's that all about? I know, they were both robots. There's like stories like that on Jerry Springer. <laughs> Jerry my Springer? Grandpa, my grandpa watches that. Yeah, he watches Is Jerry that. Springer still on television? Like they watch Mari, he watches the, the Mari show. I'm always watching that with him. You always see that. Mari Povich is still on television too? Isn't there like uh, Steve Wilco? Yes, yeah, Steve Wilco also. So. <laughs> Is Maury Povich still married to Connie Chung? <laughs> That's real important. Okay. Okay. I'm going to show you sexual parts, but they're kind of confusing sexual parts, so don't get too excited about it. Well, you get excited as you like, I guess. Some biological conditions affect fetal uh, sex characteristic uh, development, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, also adrenal, <laughs> adrenogenital syndrome, also known as adrenal... Uh, adrenogenital syndrome, is a genetic female fetus exposed to high levels of androgens during fetal development. So she's XX, she's a female. Genetically, she's a female. But because she has been bathed in testosterone, she grows testicles. Or her labia look like testicles. Her clitoris looks like penis. And as you can see, she looks like a, uh, she, potentially she looks like a male or she can be confused as a male. Now the reality is that these, as soon as the, this individual goes through puberty, all of this will change. She doesn't have testicles, so she doesn't have any, anything producing excess amounts of testosterone. Uh, but if she has this problem, of course, potentially as a child, as an infant, she will look like a male. But the reality is, as she goes through puberty, she will turn out to be a female. These are women that have this condition. A lot of times they're sterile. Unfortunately, a lot of times they're sterile. I have a question. What are androgens? I know pathogens. Are androgens. androgens. Androgens are male hormones. Oh, okay. So she just got exposed to this. Yeah. Was like in the in womb. Me, in the mm -hmm. womb. Yeah. yeah. It had something to do with uh, she was hypersensitive to the testosterone. Everybody has both testosterone and, and estrogens and, and androgens in their system. Uh, males have androgens as well. Uh, females have testosterone, and that's what creates your sex drive. Uh, but uh, this individual is hypersensitive to the androgens, to the male hormone. And because of that, of course, they, uh, they uh, as, as a youth, as, as an infant, they look, it looks like they, they may be a male because their labia look like testicles and their clitoris looks like a penis. But as you can see, they develop normal. These are four individuals that uh, have this problem. I don't know why they're standing on balls, but uh, <laughs> you can see they have uh, they have uh, breast tissue, uh, and they look female. Uh, they have the body shape of a female. Right? They have wider hips, and they have a slender waist. Uh, so they look like females. They have they have slender shoulders. So they all look female, despite the law. That's not the long hair. It doesn't have anything to do with it. Uh, this is one that uh, uh, their sensitivity to the androgens were, were very strong. So this is actually a female. This next one is actually a female. But you can see that she doesn't look 
And not only that, but her, her labia are distended as if they were testicles. Uh, and her body shape, I don't know. She's got, she's got fairly large uh, thighs. She's got a lot of body hair. I don't know if that has anything to do with anything. Anyway, she doesn't have any mammary glands. Uh, so her breast tissue or is, is not very... And she has the male uh, uh, pubic hair pattern that goes up to her, to her belly button. So does she have ovaries and fallopian tubes? She does have ovaries and fallopian tubes, uh, but they're not functional. <clears throat> I got a story too. This is going to be a good one. If she was artificially inseminated, could she um, carry? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if anybody's ever come up with that, with that idea. Uh, her uterus isn't really very well developed, as you can see. Well, um, it, it's really kind of hard to see. Okay, but I got a story. Uh, there's more here, so I've been pretty much. Okay, I got a story. So once upon a time, I, I was uh, working in the hospital, and we had a guy that was wounded in Vietnam. He was a pilot, and uh, they brought him back. I was working at uh, Wright Pack Air Force Base, and they brought this guy in, and uh, he was a mess. Uh, He'd been wounded in the abdomen and he'd been wounded in the leg. Um, he was a uh, F-4 pilot, and uh, so he was he was kind of a mess. So they brought him in. Uh, they flew him in from uh, from uh, uh, Clark. He was in Vietnam. Got wounded in Vietnam. Was shot down in Vietnam. Had all these interesting wounds on him. Uh, they shipped him to Clark. They couldn't fix him to Clark, so they shipped him back to the states. And he was from uh, Cincinnati, so they they flew him out to Dayton. To, to Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and I was working at the at the hospital at that time. I was stationed there, and so this guy comes in, and um, of course he's fairly lucid. Uh, his wounds aren't, aren't debilitating at this point, and of course he needs he needs them cleaned out and everything. Uh, but he won't stop messing with the nurses, and he grabs them every time they come in. Of course he's a, I think he's a he was a captain. Uh, he's grabbing all these nurses, and most of them are lieutenants and captains. And, and they're ordering him to stop, and he's not stopping. Uh, and his nickname is Bear. He looks just like this guy, <laughs> as, as interesting as that is. So uh, they, uh, they went in, he, he developed an abscess. Uh, his wounds wouldn't heal. Um, and so he developed an abscess in his abdomen. He had a, a, an abdominal wound. Uh, and they went in to clean him out, and what they discovered was that this guy not only had a penis and testicles, he also had a full set of ovaries and uh, a uterus. And, uh, so what was happening, yeah, this, so what was happening was he was producing a lot more, he was producing both F, uh, excessive amounts of estrogen and excessive amounts of testosterone. That's what was going on. That's why he was, wouldn't leave the nurses alone, because he was producing so much testosterone to, to overcome the estrogen. So they were, the debate was, what do we do? Do we tell this guy that he's, he's got girl parts on the inside? Do we tell him that, or do we just take him out and not tell him? Can we do that? That was the question. Of course, it's the, it's the military, so they can do whatever the hell they want to do. <laughs> so what would you do? Would you tell the bear that he's got lady parts? And, Oh, this is the military. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't have to worry about that. So what happened? Well, what happened was we took out we took out his uh, his female parts and we didn't tell him. We took out his well. The first thing we did was assign male nurses to him because <laughs> he wouldn't leave them alone, and he was grabbing them just like President Trump was talking about. Right? <laughs> it was a mess. It was he was really. Uh, and they were gonna they were gonna throw him in the, in the uh, stockade. They were gonna throw him in jail after he recovered. But his wounds were healing really slow. Uh, so they decided that what they would they needed to uh, uh, he was producing so many hormones that his immune system was relatively weak. So what they did was they took out his female parts. They didn't really tell him. Uh, and as soon as they took out his ovaries, uh, he started stop producing as much testosterone. And actually, he became relatively normal. But we were they full size ovaries? Yeah. Well, yeah, they were. Well, like a, 
the ovaries were fully functional and they were just pumping out estrogen. <laughs> so would that person be considered a, a hermaphrodite? No, he really didn't have female parts. He didn't have female breasts. Uh, he was producing a lot of testosterone. This guy was, was buff. I mean, he was massive because, you know, he'd been producing all this testosterone to, to uh, overcome all the estrogen that was being pumped out of his ovaries. So he was pretty, he was like on steroids. And, and he was grouchy, too. He was, <laughs> that's why they called him the bear. Uh, but he had lots of body hair too. He was he looked I'll tell you what, he, he could have grown a full coat of hair. He was a mess. He had to shave his, his uh, chest because it would grow up over his, his yeah, over his ball. <laughs> Get a sweater. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was weird. And uh, after uh, I was there for what, six months? And this this was a case that happened right as as I arrived there. Uh, it's actually for six months. The POWs came back while I was while I was at right back, and one of the POWs was uh, John McCain, because his his dad was stationed in uh, Washington, and so they sent him to Wright Pat because they didn't want to send him to Walter Reed. Uh, they didn't want any, any of these guys. They didn't want any of the stories to get out. Of, so as, as afterwards, did he was he okay? Did he yeah, he was fine. Yeah, everything was fine. His uh, his uh, aggressive behavior, uh, yeah, went down. Went went down a lot. He was in his thirties by this time. Um, uh, he had produced, I don't know, like four children or something. Has anybody ever studied his children? I don't know. I don't know. This is that's that's the last I heard of this guy. Um, how how yeah. did he become born like that? I don't know. Just born like that. I don't know. How was this guy born like that? Well, you saw what it was. That's a girl. That's a female. Yeah, it's a female. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a female, but it certainly looks like a guy. And it looks like he has, he's got a package going here. Something's going on down here. <laughs> I would imagine, despite the fact that his thighs look so long, his, he's almost knocked me. His thighs are so big. Um, you know. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> that's the bear. That's the story of the bear. Uh, I'm sure Sheldon said something. Oh, on that phone. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I knew a person who was on. A person who was on Africa. Oh, really? When I was on recruiting duty. Okay. Um, she came in. Uh, yeah, I was in trouble with this book. She came. She she came in and she tried to shoot me off. Let the recruiter know. I was right. just uh, at that time starting out, so I was assisting. Right. So. And uh, so the recruiter had to research if they could let her in or not. And it turned out that we told her that she'd have to go make a decision. Oh, and have one, one part. Pick one or the other and yeah. then get it done and then come back and then she could miss. Wow. And that was the policy. And Does she, she look more like a woman? Like in that? Yeah, she had, to, she, she had already decided her gender as female. Oh. She, yeah. That's why I said she, because right. that's how she carried herself. So right. She just. Uh, yeah, got it done, and then uh, I think two years later she missed it. There you go. Okay, well that's that's good news. <laughs> this was the bear, <laughs> and like I said, we didn't tell him, and we were afraid to tell him because they were afraid he would have some kind of a breakdown, knowing that he had female parts. But I guess if it's affecting his recovery, then the doctor can make that decision. He, and that's why we did it. That's that's why it happened. <clears throat> I wasn't in on the decision. Uh, I was in on the conversations. I'm not exactly sure why, but uh, I was in on the conversations, but I wasn't in on the decision. The doc, that's the reason the doctor decided that they needed to do something to, to increase his, his immune system, to uh, improve his immune system. And they were afraid it would cause all kinds of interesting psychological problems. And for that reason, they didn't tell him. That's the reason they didn't tell him. And yes, it is unethical, but like I said, it's the United States military, they can do whatever they want to do, and they obviously <laughs> did in this case. And um, <laughs> they did surgery, and they took all those parts. Out. The other problem he had, he had uh, uh, a leg, he had a leg wound, his, his, his whole thigh was opened up, and uh, it, it, it 
would close up and then would open up and close and then would open. And uh, it, it was because his immune system was so weak, but he also had a parasite in there that, uh, that we found, we found, and then we, uh, it was a mess. <laughs> so, you know, venereal disease of the leg. Yeah, it was pretty bad. <clears throat> he had trichomonas in his leg. Trichomonas is a, is a parasite that is only in the genitalia. So how in the world did he get it on his leg? Don't ask yourself that question. I know the answer because he told me the whole story. <laughs> the first day I was there, he told me the whole story. Welcome aboard story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> did I say he was Air Force? That guy was Navy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was a tail hooker. He was, he was the best. Okay, anyway, okay. Uh, so what are we dealing with here? So we're gen still dealing with gender dysphoria. You can imagine how confusing it would be to be bare or to be uh, a lady with uh, parts that look male or masculine. That can cause uh, gender dys uh, dysphoria as well. Um, um, there is a, an, an indicator that we use called with a disorder of sex, uh, sex development. Uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome is a genetic male. This, is, this guy is a genetic male, but he's insensitive to androgens. So we have women that are sensitive to androgens. We have XXs that are sensitive to androgens. We also have males that uh, uh, are not sensitive to androgens. So uh, you, as you can imagine, if they're not sensitive to androgens, they're not going to, to develop uh, masculine traits. Is this why, too, sometimes like men who take uh, testosterone or, or uh, steroids, they start to develop uh, arms and mammary glands? Yeah. Like women's breasts? Yeah. yeah. Probably the dumbest thing you can do. Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so it just happens when they have that sensitivity? Or? No. Just no. Bound to happen. no, actually, if you watch television, they talk about low T levels, that, that uh, males after age 40, they lose a certain percentage of testosterone. Uh, the reality is that this is true, that males' testosterone level will, will decline. Does it decline so much that they start acting and looking like a female? The answer is no, not normally. But there are some males that uh, once they uh, go through their climacteria, uh, their, their time of life, uh, their testosterone tanks, and their t t testosterone level is actually too lower than it should be, and, and these individuals have to get testosterone shots. What age is that? Uh, your <laughs> testosterone actually starts going down after age 30, I mean it starts declining. The reason they say that uh, the peak time for a male is at 18 is true, because their testosterone actually starts going down at age 20. It's, it goes down about 10% per decade. Is that right? Or 1% per decade? I don't know. Anyway, it's, it, it goes down a lot. Uh, so by the time they're 70 or 80 years old, they're not as masculine as they used to be. Does that make sense? All right. And so sometimes, and, and it all depends on the genetic structure of the male, you know. Uh, some males are, uh, normally don't live it, uh, past their 50s or 60s. So these individuals, it really wouldn't make any difference. But if you've got a guy that's living into his you know, 90s or 100s, uh, theoretically, his, he should have a higher testosterone level. And he should be able to maintain a higher testosterone level because he's going to need to be male for, an extent, for a, a much longer period of time. Okay. So what we do is we check their testosterone level to make sure it's, it's at a normal level. And sometimes they'll need testosterone shots. Uh, when I was working in Oklahoma, we had a guy that was in his 50s, and he would get his testosterone shot on Wednesdays so that he could have sex on Friday. <laughs> Every Wednesday, like clockwork. And when his wife, his wife went to visit somebody, and, and he didn't come in that Wednesday, well, his wife was gone. So anyway, he didn't need his Friday night fix or whatever. I'm sorry. It's. <laughs> It's he just, it, it just, what happens to you? Okay, so these guys are insensitive to androgens, so they don't have the sexual structures, they don't have the male sexual structures that they're supposed to have. Uh, these or other pseudo, 
hermaphroditic conditions or others who are troubled by cross-gender identity are giving this, this specifier this uh, with a disorder of sex development. So these guys, I'm going to, this is a picture of naked people. I apologize for that. They may look like females, but they're actually males, okay? Uh, and they are naked. And so you're going to be able to see their sexual parts. So this is the flip? If you don't want to look, don't look, okay? <laughs> it's a flip. You go, go, go. <laughs> There you go. Okay, I know. So they do look female. They have mammary glands, but they, they're not sensitive to androgens. So they, don't, uh, they're, uh, they do have penises, but they look like clitorises. Uh, they have the uh, female uh, pubic uh, uh, growth pattern. Um, and of course, this is a, this this is a male as well. He looks as as a child. They look far more like males than uh, than the uh, older females do. They don't really have the body structure of a female. They don't. Well, their their hips are not I mean, wide. The shoulders are thinner. Yeah, and their shoulders are not thinner. You would certainly not confuse these ladies with these ladies because these ladies have, have yeah exactly okay. Uh, so yeah, this is a problem. This is a problem that you can potentially have. And this is a male, uh, but as you can see, it doesn't. They don't look like their sexual parts do not look like male sexual parts. There you go. <clears throat> okay, and this is somebody. That, it's a male that is uh, insensitive to androgen, so they don't grow the male uh, stereotypical uh, physical characteristics of a male. Gender dysphoria develops in early childhood and is usually established by age three, suggesting that casual, uh, causal factors are located in prenatal or early postnatal development. So what we know now is that it develops, it's something that happens in the womb. Something isn't happening or something not happening in the womb. While androgen and estrogen exposure can affect masculinization or feminization, there is no direct evidence that hormonal exposure causes gender dysphoria. <coughs> except with the, the, one, the individuals that are not either hypersensitive to androgens or not sensitive at all to androgens. There is no clear hormonal distinctions between those with gender dysphoria and those without as adults. And here, this is a kind of a, uh, an argument that we have seen. Uh, for a while they were saying that, uh, that homosexual males and females were um, they had more cortisol. Their parents were going th through, what is that? Oh, it's a vacuum? Oh, it's a, thank you very much. That uh, these individuals were, were uh, being affected by, their, their sex hormones were being affected by cortisol. Uh, so that the cortisol was causing them to be either uh, insensitive to one or insensitive to the other. And that, that's what was causing their homosexuality. Now we know that that's not true. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how you get your sexual orientation. And we have no idea. Uh, at this point, we, we have no idea. Uh, they're, they're, they look, they're looking at brain structures, they're looking at organ structures, they're looking at, uh, at hormonal structures, and we, we haven't really found anything yet. Have you looked at animals? I got a female dog that raises her leg when she pees. I know, I know a friend of mine's dog, she had nothing but nails, and they were messing around with each other. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Huh. Oh, yeah. Or like female dogs mm -hmm. acting like mm -hmm. male dogs, like mating. Yeah, that, that happens with my females, too. <laughs> my, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My females mounting my male dog. This doesn't make any sense. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, uh, have we looked at other animals? That homosexuality is, is common in all animals. It's common in ch with chimpanzees, with monkeys, with horses, with dogs, with cats. We see this in, in a lot of different animals. Uh, sometimes when you have a male stud horse, sometimes you can't get them to breed. So they're not studs at all. <laughs> they're, uh, they, and, and they would rather, you know, mount a male horse than a female horse. I mean, we see this all the time. Um, my mother had a hen when she, was, when she was a child. And the hen laid eggs, and then all of a sudden it grew a comb. <laughs> And uh, it uh, grew spurs on its on its uh, uh, 
had the legs and it started mounting other chickens and, and producing chicks. And then it went back to being a hen again. My mother used to talk about this all the time. It lost its comb and it all of a sudden started laying eggs again. As odd as that seems. So we see this in other we see this in, uh, in animals. We see it all over in, in all animals. So denying that homosexuality isn't natural is not really true because it's. So it's not abnormal. It's no, it's not abnor abnormal at all. We you know talk to a veterinarian; he'll tell you that you know other animals have homosexual tendencies as well, and they can flip flop from male to female. Usually they don't change genders, but the, the, the chicken did. My mother's chicken did. Some animals, do they have their, their sex drive is different? Like if you take uh, goats, for example, mm -hmm. at a really young age, and they're so little, they're, they're trying to hop away. If you have goats, you'll see them. They're trying to go at, at a real, when they're still little. Yeah. And I always like, wonder like, if all the hormones are producing, and then we butcher and eat them, and then I wonder if that's affecting people. Well, it's an idea. I don't know. I have no idea. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure. <clears throat> I don't know. I, won't, I, don't know. <laughs> I think it's just the people that eat, eat the bowls. They right. boil it and they eat it. Okay. <laughs> 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 oh, man. That's a little bit serious. <laughs> He's on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> The reality oh, is, and I read this yesterday. Okay. This is like, okay. <laughs> I don't know about that. They, were, <laughs> they use they, they use the, the testicles as an aphrodisiac. So they will powder it and they will mix it with, with liquid. Well Chinese they, do that with certain things too. <laughs> uh, they have certain animal parts yeah. that, that when they dissect it. Right, he's coming. <laughs> oh, I gotta get off this chapter. <laughs> yeah, it is Wednesday night, by the way. Let me just tell you. some cedar down yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> the, the Egyptians used to do, well, I'm not, not going to tell you what they used to do, but uh, one of the things that they used to do, they used to use human body parts, and they used to powder them after the person died. Well, in Egypt, of course, it's really dry out there, so people desiccate really fast. So they would, you know, and then they'd use it as medicine. And, uh, I won't tell you about the aphrodisiac part. <laughs> it, it fits exactly with what you were talking about. <laughs> well, so animals that are injected with hormones that affects us too, like. Well, theoretically, the hormones have a different chem chemical structure than our hormones do. Yeah, so we can't inject ourselves with cow hormones and get larger. You know, growth <laughs> hormone. That's it. Just doesn't work. You know, I've seen uh, athletes do that. They go down to Mexico to buy um, winter free uh, okay. and different kind of uh, steroids and, and testosterone that's meant for animals, for, for horses, okay. and cattle. And they use it for. Uh, Does it work? Food. Yeah. Okay. That's not a really good idea. <laughs> that's a really bad idea. You may be changing your DNA. Now we know that a lot of things changes our DNA. Um, going up into space, his DNA is different than his, his twin brother that stayed on, on Earth. So there's a lot of things that change. Um, uh, in, in putting different hormones in your body may change your DNA. Um. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. I mean, we really don't with, uh, with some of the things that we're doing, with the radiation you're getting from your... What do you mean by changing DNA, the structure? Or it changes the structure, sure. Uh, it changes your epigenetics. Mm -hmm. So po potentially we're not going to look like we, you know, in a hundred years, we're not going to look like we do now. Humans are going to be different. Uh, I just insulted Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
clearly not supposed to. It's Travis's fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be real careful what I eat over there. <laughs> okay, so how do we treat these people? Okay, if they have gender dysphoria, one thing we can do is we can change their sex. We can, uh, we can allow them to have uh, gender reassignment surgery. For the longest time, you couldn't have re gender reassignment surgery in the United States. So people had to go to Sweden or Thailand or someplace else to be... Uh, to, to have their uh, uh, body parts changed, uh, so their their sexual parts changed. Medical uh, tourists. I'm sorry. Medical tourists. Yeah, medical tourists. Uh, India is another place where you can actually. In India, they don't like to do gender assignment surgery, but Thailand it happens all the time. Sweden is very common, relatively common. It is recommended that the person preparing for uh, sex reassignment first complete 12 months of life experience as the other sex and six months on the continuous hormone treatments to be a candidate for surgery. They need to know that this is really what they want. Uh, so they have to start living as the opposite sex. Uh, where do I live? I live in Iowa. Okay. Uh, Davenport. If you go to Cracker Barrel Davenport, there's this really tall lady. Uh, she's like 6'5". <laughs> uh, with, with a a body that looks more male than female, but uh, she is trans, uh, transitioning uh, into being a female, so she has uh, breast tissue and whatnot. Uh, she hasn't gotten the voice down yet, so it's kind of deep, but, <laughs> uh, but she's changing, She and her hips are widening out because she's taking the estrogen shots and whatnot. Uh, her facial hair is all gone. Uh, she wears a ponytail, which is like, she's so Anyway, I know, and, and, and she's a cracker barrel, it's really kind of interesting. And they would have to go through a psychological assessment before... Right, right, yeah. They wouldn't, they wouldn't allow them to have the surgery unless they were sure that it wouldn't cause more damage. Yeah, so they have to do a psychological assessment before they can have the surgery. As I told you, I have a former brother-in-law who is is uh, transgender um, and as far as I know that she hasn't she hasn't transitioned yet it's hard for me to call her a her because she was my brother-in-law but uh, uh, and not to call her Bob because she wants to be called Vivian but uh, at, at the, this point of course she uh, is still a male or is still physically a male I guess she's transitioning to be a female uh, but I like I said I haven't talked to her for a long time uh, reviews about uh, outcome literature reveal that most transsexuals are satisfied with the outcome of their sex reassignment surgery, uh, which is logical because these individuals have felt like the opposite sex all of their lives. They felt like the, the female them if they are male or the male them if they are female. Uh, like I said, well, like uh, we, we said in the lecture, uh, a lot more freak this happens a lot more frequently with males than females. We don't see females that are transitioning uh, as, as readily as males. Anyway, okay, good. <laughs> no more talk about goat testicles. <laughs> Please. <laughs> you don't mind, do you? <laughs> if we leave that subject to somebody else. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, this is the 10th the week, and I'm starting on Chapter 10, so I'm caught up. Before we start, just can, I, can I ask a question about homosexuality? Sure. I was just curious, I was going to ask, I forgot to ask this uh, Monday, but is there a, a category for like, homosexuals that only prefer uh, people that are straight from the other, other sex? Wow. Jeez, uh, that's like an angry rapist, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, there is, but uh, it's considered a fetish within a fetish, I guess. Yeah, that would be a fetish. But they wanted to... It's, it's like rape, if you think about it. Yeah. Yeah, because they're trying to seduce somebody that doesn't want to have sex with them. Or, or they trick them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, what was that movie where they tricked the guy? He finally, finally shook the lady down and it turned out it was, they had male parts. Who was it? Who movie was that? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> 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 that one, she was the 
Brandon no, 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 no. This was uh, this was like 25 years ago. It was a really famous movie. It was the first one. It's a it's an English movie. Oh, English. Yeah. I, I noticed that it was in um, sort of, uh, more. I don't want to say more prominent. Just my own observation with, sure. with females who are homosexual. They'll only want to, or they have a a higher uh, attraction to women who are straight. Females who are straight. Like they'll bypass other homosexual women hmm. in preference of a uh, straight woman. Hmm. And, uh, I just always thought, I didn't know what that was about. I thought it was a little odd. Yeah. That, well, that, I mean, they're already attracted to women in general, so I don't think it's like odd for them to be attracted to straight women. No, I'm saying that they'll buy, they'll prefer, if they're, of all the women out there, they'll only prefer the ones that are straight. They won't prefer another homosexual woman. They'll want to seduce a, a straight woman. Like that's interesting. My my wife had a friend who was gay, and she took her to a, uh, a lesbian bar one night. And uh, <laughs> and of course, my wife is straight. My <laughs> wife is straight. Uh, but when she went to the bathroom, geez, she said it was like half the room decided to go to the bathroom at the same time. It was, it was really kind of interesting. <clears throat> But her friend uh, prefer, didn't prefer it straight away, obviously. Okay, so you know, I, I, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I guess it's, it's like rape. It would be like rape. Seducing somebody that doesn't want to be seduced would be like dating, <coughs> wouldn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> so that would be a fetish. So did you find that lady? <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> no, I got punched out by a lady one night. <laughs> no, this is a lot older oh. than that. Boys don't cry. No, that's yeah. not. That's not. Yeah, it. sure. that's no, it's a. It's about. Uh, uh, um, it's about about the Irish Republican Army, and they capture this this. Uh, British soldier, and uh, he makes friends with this guy, and uh, it's, it, he's a black soldier, and the, uh, the, IRA, the IRA guy makes friends with him, and he tells him about this, if he dies, if he's killed, then he wants him to go and, and, and see his girlfriend, and, uh, and he is, he, he gets killed by the, uh, the, by the IRA. And then, so this guy goes back to Belfast or someplace, and, and uh, you know, he's, this lady's a singer. I don't know the name of the movie. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's a really fascinating movie, but it's the first one that dealt with uh, with that whole transgenderism thing. I don't have a lot of answers as far as uh, homosexuality is concerned. This is uh, an area of psychology that is relatively new uh, because the it wasn't game. the crying game. That's it. The crying game. <laughs> Thank you so much. I yeah. came out with stripes by Bill Murphy. Stripes. Oh, that was. I don't know if there's anybody that's gay in that. In that movie. <laughs> Uh, so this is a relatively new area. Uh, it's, it's a new area that we just started talking about, uh, despite the fact that uh, Freud, of course, knew that you could change somebody that was gay well, to not know, gay. The interesting thing is, if you go look back in history, uh, as far as with homosexuality, there are some cultures, like, take for instance the Greek culture, and some of their uh, independent cities where homosexuality was, uh, was accepted, there, wasn't, there was no... There was, yeah, there was no taboo on it. And they used it for uh, their sexual. They were a lot more open with their sexuality. Right. And uh, so there's certain cultures going back in time where it wasn't a big deal. Right. It was just it was just right. it was just sex with another person. You know, they, they, right. And so, yeah, so, there's a lot of artwork, uh, gay artwork, uh, <clears throat> coming out of Greece that they've hidden or broken, destroyed. Uh, I probably showed you the the picture of the, the moche pottery. 
Uh, and you can look up Mochi Potter and see some really interesting things. But uh, the the, uh, the Catholic Church destroyed most of that body. So is that kind of like Freudism, like that repression of sexuality? Because right. even with uh, pre-Columbian, I think uh, here in North America, uh, for the most part, as far as I know, I haven't seen anything that, that counters this, but that homosexuality was, was accepted. It was, right. It was, it was the, no, wasn't looked at as right. anything wrong as with the person. No. Exactly. And it didn't start until uh, till the church came in. Exactly. The church came in and changed everything. Changed the way that people look at things. And because of that, uh, then it changed the way that uh, that, that uh, individuals react to, to different questions, you know, like homosexuality or transgenderism. Or like that. So you think a lot of our thoughts on this is modeled or not modeled on conditioned? Yes. The way we're, we're, we're raised, the, the culture? Right. Yeah, I think your culture changes because you come in contact with somebody that rejects that idea. Cultures will change. So, uh, well, uh, an example would be uh, you know, how, how were the people acting in England before when they were Druids uh, as compared to how they acted after the church came in? Oh, they were just like us. They had their own culture, their own language. Yeah, yeah, they, they, like, yeah they exactly. Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. 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 So the church came in and changed the way they see things, changed the way they interpret things, and I'm I'm afraid that's what that's what has also happened with uh, with the American Indian tribes. Uh, so so what you see as your traditions now may not be the traditions that you had pre-Columbia, before Westerners got here, and before they infused you with Christianity or with whatever religion. Yeah. So it's just something to think about. But of course, there's That's no way of going back. I saw one. Little <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I think a lot of that causes a lot of um, you know, disgeneration and you know, kind of confusion and high suicide rate for those, right. those individuals trying to figure out which is normal right. and which is not normal. Right. right. Yeah. So okay. is, that, is that considered historical trauma? Yeah. Or I would call it historical trauma. Um, I, I'm assuming that you would accept that uh, that definition, but the, but it's for you to decide, not for me to decide. I'm, I'm, I can't tell you what is historical trauma for you. You have to tell me what. It is. I never even believed in historical trauma until this class. Oh, okay. Until that last conversation we had about historical trauma. Yeah. It really just changed my mind. I didn't mean my it. perspective on it. <laughs> I, didn't mean to, <laughs> I didn't mean to mess you up. <laughs> and now we've driven Sheldon out of the room. Oh my it's God, what am I doing it's that? Snack bar. It's a famous snack. So, our culture, now we'll talk about culture is homosexuality okay? Or is it a big no? And then no one don't even talk about I think it's, it comes to a choice. When it becomes a choice, then it's wrong. But if they're born with it, then it's uh, kind of uh, in a way to where your family's rich right. with that individual. Right. You mean if they're born with If they're born with both. Yeah, so. But if it, once they start to make choices, like <clears throat> I don't prefer to live with a man. Right. I prefer my unknown uh, woman. That's when you start to challenge the, the, the I guess, the principles of saint marie Trapezon. That's when you begin to challenge those uh, natural laws. Right. And that's when it come, it, it's really confusing. Right. But if you don't have a choice, then that's when there's, um, there's actually prayers that go with that individual. Right. And there's actually a richness to it mm -hmm. as, as, as a family. So that's how my grandmother told me and my grandfather, they said, but once you do, you make it a choice, like uh, you're born with all male, you know, you're male. Right. So once you begin to decide and challenge that you're male, then you want to change. And that's a choice. Female. And so that's when you start challenging that natural law. 
So we're talking about transgender, not yeah. specifically from a book, like from a, not from a, but I mean like homosexuality, you're talking about transgender. Yeah. I think because there's we, a difference. Yeah. I think too with now in culture it's more about <clears throat> responsibility because at that time too, if you go back to a couple hundred years, it was just about the just your responsibility to your family, so they were, they were gender rules. Mm -hmm. As long as you did your fulfilled your role, you were free from there to do whatever you wanted. It's interesting. Have you guys read about the different types of like, um, like the different types of genders though? Like um, in the Apple culture, like traditionally there's like four. If you go to like not not just like not like <coughs> hip, but like there's more. Like, if you go to ceremonies, like there's different levels of Navajos. I think there's people who are completely integrated into Western society, like mm -hmm. the Phoenix, never come back. Oh, my grandma lives from Chimneys. So, you know, that's all they know. Mm -hmm. To people who are. Uh, there's no true Dinet left, right? There's mm -hmm. no, at this point, but as close back as you can get to people that only speak Dinet. Like my grandma, she never spoke English and stuff like that. It's her only medicine. Work. So there's, there's a sliding scale, the rest of us mm -hmm. fall somewhere in between. The closer you get to the people who only speak Navajo and go to ceremonies like that, but I've, I've noticed that homosexuality isn't even noticed. If you go to, like, like for instance, if you go to in da in the summer or <coughs> give a chain in the wintertime mm -hmm. and you follow a certain uh, medicine, you'll see a lot of uh, homosexuality people, uh, homosexual people that are, that are accepted and there's no second thought and they're just mm -hmm. integrated. It's not until you get further away from that kind of traditional mentality into more of a culture people mm -hmm. where it becomes an issue. And then, you know, it doesn't even get talked about that, but some of that, a lot of uh, homosexuals even <coughs> people that are well, in ceremonies, and they're not looked at any differently than anybody else. It's everybody's judged as the person mm -hmm. and not really. So, in a way, that correlates to what Bruce said about the sort of trauma. Yeah. Like, that's just what mm -hmm. they've been taught that, like, oh, this is wrong, and yeah. you know, by Western culture. Mm -hmm. So, traditionally, it wasn't overseen? Because I know there's some medicine men that are like that. Well, that I, are, yeah, I think. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta take it with a, a bit of salt when you say traditional, because there's no real, true traditional Navajos left anymore. Mm -hmm. the, the last few of them are, are dying off. There's only a few people that can still sp that grew up speaking Navajo, grew up in a whole mm -hmm. we going to certain ways, and the rest of us are all cultured to some degree, and because of that, Western society kind of uh, tints our our lens a bit. But um, if you go back traditionally again. All they cared about, I won't say all they cared about, but they didn't care about your sexual orientation more based on are you going to do your job? Are you going to cook? Yeah. Are you going to <coughs> survive? You know, that's all they really cared about. Did you get the job done? Mm -hmm. And then anything beyond that is, is up to you to decide how you want to do your job. Because in the traditional ceremonies, like the Yeti ceremony, you have actually all male that go out to dance, and some of these masks are actually female masks. Yeah. And that's when they reconnect and they put those female masks on. They grow their hair long. Because even in the net culture, like uh, I tell my son this, you know, like inside of you, you have two, mm -hmm. and he's not homosexual. I don't know he's in Tennessee's and I just, this is what I tell him when I talk about discussion of how uh, you treat women, that you don't talk bad because inside of you, you have and then you're supposed to be in and you have that duality mm -hmm. and it makes you actually more flexible mm -hmm. in, in able to accomplish a higher potential for this. Mm -hmm.